much. Welcome to the Diabetic Mo Group. Today, it's an honor to have Professor Chantel, a renowned person in the medical field, just everything diabetes in general. So we are going to allow you to introduce yourself. Thank you very much, and uh, it's a pleasure. I've never been in the presence of a mogul. I'm very honored to be here. I'm an endocrinologist for, well, more than 30 years now. I am working in Leuven in Belgium, a very small country in Europe, 30 kilometers from Brussels. I have been the president of the uh, Patient Association in Flanders, and now I am. Uh, I have been the president also of the European Diabetes Forum, and now I am the president of the uh, EASD, the European Association for the Study of Diabetes. Thank you so much for honoring our invite to be part of us. And also I'm with my colleague, Kona, she's going to be asking questions. We're going to do that together because we're co-hosts. We do this podcast together. Professor Chantal, maybe if you can maybe just describing a day in your life, what you do as a medical doctor, as a professor, a board of director for so many associations we have. You know, dear EASD. Well, a day in my life starts quite early. I'm an early bird. I like to come to the hospital where also my laboratory is quite early in the morning. The first thing I do is to check my inbox and then I sigh very deeply because in one day there's three to 350 emails coming in. I've given up the battle of having an empty inbox. Now and then I succeed. But uh, I do a lot of uh, emailing and a lot of Zoom and Teams meeting throughout the day, linking with colleagues all over the world to discuss uh, research in diabetes, but also to discuss policy, how to put diabetes on the agenda of the policymakers, how to be sure that the European politicians uh, give attention to diabetes, that the Belgian politicians give attention to diabetes. So that is a very part of my day most of the time. And then if it's a good day, I get to spend some time with uh, my colleagues uh, who do the research uh, together with me. I still have a basic research laboratory, but there, of course, I can only do that because I have very co good colleagues who lead it. A person like Connie Jesemans. We do research on trying to better understand how type 1 diabetes exists and how the immune system interacts with the beta cell and how the beta cell eventually is destroyed. We do that more uh, with humans, uh, trying to understand how this disease exists. So that is a good day where I can do research. A lot of my time I also spend discussing with all my good colleagues in Inodia, trying to coordinate how to work together in Europe and then also in the world around type 1 diabetes, how to prevent it, how to arrest it. At the moment, we are running different trials, intervention trials in Inodia in people with newly diagnosed type 1 trying to learn how to stop uh, this disease. This is when it's a very good day. Another part of a very good day in my week is when I get to do clinic because I still see people living with diabetes in the outpatient clinic. Most of the weeks, I have three to five half days of clinic, seeing people with type 1 or type 2 diabetes and, and guiding them uh, on how to live a good life, on how to prevent complications. And that honestly makes my day if I can talk with people living with the disease. That's all good day. Creeps in. I have to make reports. I need to talk to the managers of this hospital. I need to talk to policy people about reimbursement and blah, 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 blah. And that is a bad day. And unfortunately, that takes a lot of my time doing uh, administration. But as you grow older, it is part of the game. Some people who've seen me on webinars will recognize this room. This is my Zoom room. This is my office. And so now with face-to-face -face meetings happening, and I have chair uh, because this is the place where I do a lot of my weekends. What made you devote your career to diabetes? Medicine is broad. There are many domains. First of all, I chose internal medicine, which is a part of medicine where um, there's a lot of emphasis on making a diagnosis and installing a treatment. 
I was also interested in immunology already. And of course comes type 1 diabetes. And so as a young doctor, I was recruited by my boss, Professor Bouillon, to do research on the pathogenesis of type 1 diabetes. And internal medicine to then type 1 diabetes was actually patient story. It sounds very, very soft when I tell this, but it's true. It was the story of two men convinced me that I wanted to make a better life for people with type 1 diabetes. One was a man of, I think he was 30, 32, of my own village, close to Brussels. And he had a massive myocardial infarction here in the university hospital. When I looked at his story, he was treated very, very badly. I mean, I'm talking about beginning of the 90s, and he still was treated like in the 50s by a cardiologist. He was not even treated by an endocrinologist. He was treated by his primary care physician and a cardiologist. And he had a hemoglobin A1C of 11. He didn't know anything about modern insulin therapy, we were already in the 90s. So this story said to me, this is not correct. We need to do this different. And then a second story of a patient was again a young boy who came to our department, University Hospital, with the bleeding in one eye. And he was young. And again, he was treated very badly. He was he had as a hobby to be a nature guy. And so when I first saw him, he was blind in one eye. He progressively became completely blind. And so we worked together. And then after a couple of months, he had a severe hypoglycemic attack during the night and he died. And so these two men really got under my skin and really convinced me we need to treat this disease differently and we need to prevent it and cure it. Your enthusiasm, your passion, your interest, everything about this is mostly driven by the things that you know and the things. And because you can't just come out and say, wow, we need to challenge the system, to change the status quo of how people living with diabetes are being treated. And because I think maybe the question that I wanted to ask you next, uh, you have partly answered it. So now I have to take a different question. What you would recommend to families with a newly child living with diabetes? Yes, I have a lot of um, people with newly diagnosed uh, uh, type 1 and with families where somebody has newly diagnosed type 1. I'm also involved with children because of our intervention studies that we do. First of all, I tell them to have hope. Over the last 30 years, a lot has changed, like the coming about of the hybrid closed loop systems now with the intelligent smart pumps, the sensors. This has been a revolution for people living with type 1 diabetes. But I'm also looking and, you know, disclaimer, I am advising several companies. So I'm looking with a very, very positive eye to everything that is now happening with the islet transplantation, with the newly generated islets. If you look at these data, I am fully convinced that hybrid closed loop systems are intelligent pumps important, but will be a first step to really be able to replace beta cells in people with type 1 diabetes. So the main message is hope. The second message is make diabetes fit in your life. Don't make it your enemy. Don't fight diabetes. It is there. Live with it. Find a place for it in your life. Because, you know, it's like a little devil on your shoulder. It's always there. And so you can choose to be happy with it or you can choose to be unhappy with it. And finding a good place for it is very, very important realizing that it's there, but trying to, you know, live with it. And and again, don't let it stop you. I have people with type 1 diabetes who live very standard lives, like a life like I live, very boring. But then I have people who do crazy things, who run marathons, who climb, you know, cycle 300 kilometers a week. So don't let type 1 diabetes stop you, but take care of your body. Treat your type 1 diabetes well. Give intensive insulin therapy. Make it your friend. Give it a place in your life. Thank you for your uh, response. I would like uh, if you could share with us some outcomes of the research that you are currently on about vitamin D and the immunity system and diabetes. Also, the prevention of type 1 diabetes and generally function of beta cells. A lot of my research over the last 30 years has been on the immune effect of uh, vitamin D. People had discovered that receptors for vitamin D are present on immune cells. And as you know, nature rarely does something without a reason. And so 
receptors being there, but then also the discovery that immune cells make vitamin D, that they can activate vitamin D. So there must be a role for vitamin D in the immune system. And so we know from old studies that people who are very vitamin D deficient have a higher risk of bacterial infections. We know in the 19th century that people with vitamin D deficiency had more tuberculosis. And so there is a, a role for vitamin D in the immune system. And so what we show in mice, but there's also good correlations in humans, is that if you are very vitamin D deficient in early life, if you are genetically at risk of type 1 diabetes, that then you have a, a higher risk of getting type 1 diabetes. So being genetically at risk for type 1 and then having a very low vitamin D is a bad combination. So first lesson that we learn also in our uh, mouse work is if you are genetically at risk for type 1, if your father, your mother, your brother, your sister has type 1 diabetes, avoid vitamin D deficiency, especially in young age. Second thing that we showed is that in mice, and OD mice that get type 1 diabetes, that they're giving very high doses of vitamin D could delay or prevent type 1 diabetes. Now, translating that to humans is very difficult because the doses that were needed to prevent the disease in mice are toxic. We cannot do that in humans because you get hypercalcemia. So in humans, you would need vitamin D analogs that still work on the immune system, but work less on calcium and on bone. And so there we are a little bit stuck because at the moment there are no good insulin analogs that still work on the immune system, but not on calcium and, and bone. But so the major lesson for all of us is if you are genetically at risk for type 1, avoid vitamin D deficiency in early life. Now, our work on vitamin D has brought us to understanding better how the immune system behaves in people and in mice on the way to type 1 diabetes. And so we have discovered that uh, specific cells, dendritic cells, playing a role in presentation of antigens to uh, the immune system, that there, these cells are very central cells in the immune system and in the progress to type 1 diabetes. And so, for instance, Bartrup in Leiden is doing very interesting research on how we can harness dendritic cells of people who have recent onset type 1 diabetes to make the immune system tolerant to the beta cell and not attack the beta cell. And so there's interesting uh, work on that ongoing in, in lab. But the major progress in uh, type 1 diabetes was really understanding that we could interfere with the balance of attacker immune cells and regulator immune cells. And so with vitamin D, that's exactly what you do. You get more regulator immune cells and, and less attacker cells. But in the meantime, other agents have been tested. And for instance, one now has been approved by the uh, FDA, the Food and Drug Administration last year, and that's teplizuma, which is an antibody directed against specific cells of the immune system namely cells that carry CD3 on their surface. And so by administering teplizima to people very close to the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes, you can stop the destruction and you can delay the progression towards clinical type 1 diabetes by two to three years. And so this drug is now approved in the United States for treatment of people very close to the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. It's called t zealed and it can indeed delay type 1 diabetes by interfering with this balance of attacker cells and regulator cells, giving people more regulation of the immune system. The bad thing, Connor, is that the company who put this tea zealed on the market priced it at more than $190,000. So for poor people like us in Belgium, impossible. So we do hope that in the future with new therapies coming 
also interfering with this balance between the attacker and the regulator cells, that these prices will be more democratic, allowing people around the world and not only rich Americans to be able to use these aids. But again, big message of hope for everybody who is at risk for type 1 diabetes or who is newly diagnosed, that therapies are coming. And as you know, in Inodia, we are now testing therapies to interfere with the immune system or to make the beta cells stronger, have this mass of beta cells present longer in people with newly diagnosed. The diabetes community already, they are fascinated, especially people like us who have been attending ESD, ACTD, the projects that you do at Inodia in, on the prevention and the intervention in the type 1 diabetes. So maybe if you could help us with the audience to help us understand your work in terms of eligibility and the impact of the people that are involved in it. Inodia was a project of the European Commission, actually, of the Innovative Medicines Initiative, which promotes collaboration between academics and industry. It was a project where we collected blood and urine and stool from people with newly diagnosed type 1 diabetes and from unaffected family members. That project is coming to an end, but we are now moving into the next stage where we are inviting people with newly diagnosed type 1 diabetes to join in trials. I can invite people to go to the website inodia.eu and there will be another uh, website coming very soon. There will be a link between the two websites. But so if you type in Google inodia, so I-N-N-O-D-I-A, you will find it. So what is the inclusion criteria? It's for all of these intervention trials, it's people with newly diagnosed T1D. As soon as after your diagnosis as possible, six weeks, depending on the study, but it's crucial to be very, very rapid because every day you lose a little bit more of your own functional beta cell mass. So inclusion as soon as possible after diagnosis. The age is very different from study to study. We have studies now running in children from five years of age to 25 years of age, in adults above 18 years of age, so keep an eye out on this website of Inodia and you'll see the uh, studies happening. Hopefully in the next months or year, we also hope to be able to do uh, intervention studies in those who are just before the diagnosis. So people where presence of autoantibodies, so signals that you're on the path to type 1 diabetes have been discovered. And again, throughout the world, throughout Europe, different countries have initiatives on screening of general population for presence of autoantibodies. So if you have been found to have autoantibodies, again, keep an eye out on Inodia because specific groups will also be invited to participate in intervention trials. That's great. Thank you. We will have a look at uh, in audio for sure. You have been in numerous seminars, conferences, panels. What changes have you seen since people with diabetes started in such events? How important do you think it is for diabetics to represent in uh, such events? To me, this is crucial. And again, for a clinician working with people with diabetes, it's obvious that they are our guides. They are the light in the harbor who say where we need to go. It's obvious because you can design a study, make it into a beautiful study. But if the people you then want to recruit say, what? This is too intensive. This cannot be done. Then you have your beautiful study, but nobody will participate. So when we created Inodia many, many, many years ago, we had from the beginning what we call the patient advisory committee that advised us on the protocol. If we said we want to do a blood sampling every month because it would be very interesting, they said, are you kidding us? You need to tell us why every blood sample is important. And then they guided us into making a realistic design where we could also recruit patients. So having the presence of patient voice, so the voice of people living with the disease or at risk of a disease when designing clinical studies is very important. But also for my basic research colleagues, it is crucial to have an interaction 
with people living with the disease you're studying. Why? Because it's like the light in the harbor. Why am I doing this? Where am I going? But also people with the disease want to know what does it mean to me? When we had this patient advisory committee in the beginning, the basic researchers, when the patients asked the question, what does it mean to me? They explain their research in lay language. But that's not what does it mean to me? You know, what will this make as a difference? So in Inodia, we always introduce this, what does it mean to me? What will this change? Why are you doing this? My young researchers, my PhD students, they really appreciate this because they think themselves now, what does this mean to people with diabetes? Patient voice and having an audience of people living with the disease makes you translate your research in lay language, and that's fine, but it also makes you translate it into what does it mean for the people? How will it change their life? And it's important because people living with the disease are the taxpayers, and they raise funds, and they bring attention to this disease. It's an, an important, and to me, an unavoidable combination. Many, many years ago, when Bastian uh, from DDoC asked to have a presence of people with diabetes in the ESD, the leadership said, oh, we cannot have patients inside. You know, they needed to be in a hotel close to the meeting because it would be like they would infect <laughs> the researchers. And so with clinicians coming in the board, we said, are you kidding us? Of course, they need to be inside. And so since many years now at ESD, but also other conferences, people living with the disease are present. And that's the way it should be. And you should continue to ask, what does your research mean to me? For that, we give a big shout out to Bastian, the CEO of the DDoc Voice, which I'm part of as well. And hopefully Kona will be part of it too. Thank you so much with everything, everything, your passion that we sense in everything that you're talking about. We can really listen because you also want the involvement of people living with diabetes because we are the people that this is about. Usually the people living with diabetes would say, there's nothing about us without us. And thank you for living through that mantra to say, yes, we cannot do this. Can I add something? People with type 1 have loud voices. And that's fine. I'm always a little bit frustrated about is finding people with type 2 diabetes to have a voice. Something very special is happening there where I find some discrimination between type 1 and type 2 diabetes, where there is this idea that people with type 2 diabetes did it to themselves, which is not the case. I mean, you get type 2 diabetes because you have a two-week beta cell. Otherwise, you would make an insulin. And so there's a lot of shaming around type 2 diabetes. And finding people with type 2 for patient advisory committees is so difficult. So if people with type 2 diabetes are listening, I would say there's no reason, no reason why people with type 2 diabetes would feel inferior to people with type 1. It's a disease like another. And the voice of people with type 2 diabetes should also be heard. Well, thank you so much, Professor, for speaking with great understanding. And I hope that they are going to listen to this. So thank you so much for using your voice to challenge that as well. As a person who has attended ISPAD 2020, and I think you remember this because these are things that you leave for, the things that you're doing each and every day. You highlighted some of the glycemic related and meat needs like glycemic control, weight gain, risk of hyperglycemia, and also the chronic complications that exist. Now we are in 2023, so we needed maybe to say, okay, what progress has they been made about these unmet needs? Have they been met as of yet? As I said, there's a lot of evolution in the way we treat type 1 diabetes in the present day. We have insulin analogs that allow us to live more flexible life with the long acting analogs and then the short acting analogs every time, uh, the rapid acting analogs every time we eat. The sensors, continuous glucose monitoring or scanning glucose monitoring have altered the way we collect data. And then another important point is the smart pump, the pumps that are connected now to sensors. Of course, I hear everybody now saying, yeah, 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 in a rich country. And that, to me, is the big unmet need at the moment. And that is accessibility, affordability. Even in a country like the United States, 
prices of insulin were incredible. Now they've just changed where accessibility will be improved. But thinking of Africa, thinking of South America, thinking of Asia, accessibility to all of these good treatments for people with type 1 diabetes and to medical teams. Think of my two boys many, many years ago who were treated by doctors who were not very interested or didn't know what to do. That's still the reality. If you are treated with a doctor who only has one or two people with type 1 diabetes, chances are very slim that he or she know the latest development. And chances are very high that he will treat you the way he was taught in medical school. So accessibility to medical systems, accessibility to tools, and thus affordability of tools is to me the biggest unmet need because we do have better and better tools to treat people with type 1. Thank you so much. I have a quick question, a dilemma. If you were to choose between accessibility for every type 1 diabetic to CGM or insulin pump, what would you choose? Without doubt, the CGM. So in Belgium, we have looked at the impact of introduction of pumps in our country and then a few years later on the introduction of sensors in our country on hemoglobin A1C. And the introduction of pumps had a very small impact. The introduction of sensors had a dramatic impact. If I may choose, I would choose the a hybrid closed loop system. But if you have one euro you can spend, spend it on the sensor. Thank you so much for everything, everything that you have just shared with us already. My understanding with everything that you have been sharing on the conferences that I've been attending, briefly explain to us the impact of the new medications in diabetes treatment in Belgium. Maybe just sort of like the status quo of diabetes care in Belgium, how is it like? Belgium is a good country to live in if you have diabetes because we do have access to all insulin analogs for people with type 1 diabetes. We have access to sensors, we have access to insulin pumps, so that's all very good. For type 2 diabetes, there we do have restrictions for the new agents like the GLP-1 receptor agonists and the SGLT2 inhibitors because they are more expensive. Our government restricted the access in a very glucocentric way. So only people with a specific BMI or a range of hemoglobin A1C can get a GLP-1 receptor agonist. And also, we do not have reimbursement uh, CGM in people with type 2, which is, I believe, a very bad thing. For type 2 diabetes, the situation is a bit more complex because there we do have limitations in the reimbursement of specific agents like uh, SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 receptor agonists where there's a very glucocentric limitation on reimbursement. And also, uh, we don't have a CGM reimbursement for people with type 2 diabetes, uh, which is a shame, I think, even not those with insulin. Thank you so much, Professor. It's not just for people living with diabetes, but also for the healthcare professionals that should be challenged or encouraged by your words of wisdom because you've been in this for a while. Your knowledge, everything, your research, being part of so many diabetes organizations, which is great because of your knowledge, we cannot thank you enough. And we hope that people that are going to listen to this will be somewhat encouraged and inspired to do so, even for my colleague here, Connor, because she's also a medical doctor and also a person living with diabetes. I don't know if you have last words of wisdom, just last words for the healthcare professionals, for people living with diabetes, the industry at large. Famous last words. First of all, for healthcare professionals, doing endocrinology, doing diabetes care is amazing. It's very rewarding. Uh, it's stimulating on the diagnostic side, on the therapeutic side. Uh, working with uh, people living with a chronic disease is very stimulating. I know my patients sometimes for more than 30 years. I know I saw their children be born. I saw them get divorced. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's so interesting because you see the whole life of, of the individual. For the people with type 1, again, and, and for families living with type 1, what I said before, embrace your diabetes. Give it a place in your life. Don't fight it. Don't make it your enemy. You will have to live with this disease. And if it's an enemy, it's a waste of energy. And then for industry, please stay in diabetes. Please continue to do research for novel agents, novel therapeutics, and especially stay or come 
to type 1 diabetes because it's still a shitty disease and we need to, um, you know, we need to find ways to prevent and cure it. Thank you so much. I want to make also a confession about you. I first saw you in the IDF Congress. I couldn't attend in, in person. I was virtually because I had COVID. I saw you. Uh, you know, as a medical student, I've been to many conferences and see many people presenting and speaking. I think you were the only person that could come to an outcome, uh, had clear answers to every question. Usually when uh, doctors present, they go to the other pathophysiology, the molecular pathways, but they don't come to a final step. Yes, I don't know how to say that is because for many, many years, I have now been challenged. I've been challenged by people living with diabetes asking me, what does it mean to me? What is the bottom line? You had the answers and clear answers, not uh, diplomatic answers. And that really inspired me. And I want to thank you so much. Continue your good work. <laughs> thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Professor. And for that, with all being said, we cannot thank you enough. A long live to you, your team that you're working with. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.